This is the DMT 121 episode 13 on the 13th of June 2013, an interview with the 88 TC88. Great, so I'm really happy to be here uh, on the DMT 121 uh, show with uh, Thomas uh, Raymer, the CEO of 88 TC88. And uh, hi, Thomas, and great to have you on. How's it going? Hi, Andrea. Everything's going well. How are you? Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, and uh, Thomas, uh, all the way from Beijing. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, I've had uh, uh, Thomas on the show before, but we're talking about uh, three years ago. So it's, uh, it's a lifetime ago in uh, April 2010 for episode number 56. So uh, so first of all, before we talk about what happened in the last uh, three years or so, I wanted to uh, ask you to, to give a, a, a very quick pitch on, on what 88 DC88 does for people that hadn't heard that show back then. Uh, thank you. Yes, we are a company that um, sells music, games, apps, and ebooks into China. Three years ago, we did that on a B2B basis. Uh, a year ago, we started our own forays into the B2C area with our own platform called Paishoba. Yeah. That is a content platform uh, for the Chinese market, for the Chinese consumer, and it's all mobile. Right. Um, we do a lot of localization and translation and um, uh, mm -hmm. you know that's uh, our main gig because we believe that the adaptation of content, adoption of content, sorry, will be stronger uh, when people can uh, consume it in their own uh, mother tongue. Sure, and uh, so let's talk about, uh, so pick it up where we left off. So uh, how has the company evolved uh, since 2010? And uh, uh, I know that it's, it's a long story because it's three years worth of work, uh, but uh, just sort of like a, a briefly, what, what are your milestones for, for the company in the past three years? We have uh, continued and uh, with our B2B business, meaning licensing to the big Chinese mobile carriers, yeah. China Mobile, China Ucom, China Telecom. Uh, we are still doing that, uh, but it was a logical extension for us to uh, branch out and use the activity around smartphones and mobile in this country, which is, uh, you know, um, gearing up heavily. Yeah. We're talking uh, 450 million uh, smartphones existing in this market today. They are taking away a lot of the thunder from the mobile carriers, and uh, we believe that this newly found freedom of expression and individualism is great for content, and that's why we've built Paishoba, yeah. uh, our B two C platform. It's uh, you know in the press, it's referred to as the iTunes for China because iTunes isn't here. Yeah. I don't like that comparison too much because we also have a social angle which iTunes doesn't have. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, so let's talk about. Uh, first of all, I wanted to t to approach broadly, sort of what is happening in China as far as. Uh, consumption of legal music and concerned and then we can talk about uh, your services which are super interesting so uh, first of all you know w one of the things that you talked about on your on, on your blog uh, for 8080c88 which is actually pretty cool i would uh, suggest people go and check it out if you're interested in issues around china uh, so um there's a there's a whole thing about uh, uh this uh, july 1st uh, deadline that was put forward by uh, one of the music industry executives uh, called uh, gao xia song uh, my pronunciation is horrible, uh, but uh, yeah. So essentially, it's a it's a uh, the, the carriers and and the, and the um, mo music stores and the music uh, consumption services uh, it kept pushing back the date where they were going to start charging for these services. And so uh, this guy decided to sort of set them a deadline, essentially to to get them to to uh, to start charging for it. So how did how how has that idea evolved in the past few months since he has set this deadline? Um. Well, China is an interesting phenomenon because all the laws are in place, but of course the execution is not really there. Yeah. And, um, but I think that uh, by now everybody has understood that if you create a market, uh, a lot of people can make money, including the government, because it's about tax, right? Yeah. So because they've understood that very well, um, now also the big boys in the room, the Baidu's and Tencent's of this world, are being pushed into you know turning this big market into a viable market, yeah. and uh, that is a critical point. We don't know if it's going to happen on July first, but we see very clear signs that everybody is preparing for it. In terms of uh, the music offerings, you know, get bigger. People start to pick up the conversation with the content providers. Yeah. They start to pay advances, and they also prepare their applications and platforms 
for um, microtransactions, you know, taking money from the consumer for content. Yeah. I doubt that this is going to happen in the traditional Western way that you pay for downloads. Uh, I think China is already further advanced than that. They will go straight into subscription, ad-based and streaming. And this is where um, it's heading. But it's for sure that content will cease to exist to being legally for free here. Yeah, yeah. And, sh and the interesting thing about the Chinese market is, of course, the, 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 the major labels uh, that operate you know, outside of China and have a, a, a stronghold you know, for the, for, on the industry, uh, they, they don't have that, that much weight, really, uh, compared to, to the rest of the world. And Because so, uh, uh, I was reading that only 2% of revenues on the mobile content space are generated by Western media. So uh, that's, that's a very interesting figure. And so who, who's the main player or who are the, the main players on, on the label side in China? Um, the Chinese labels, of course, and uh, the Chinese artists, uh, whom of which, interestingly enough, are mostly conducting their own business. So they have very clearly understood that the brand value is the key value in this content, uh, um, uh, content exploitation chain. Yeah. And uh, they control that themselves. You know, it stems from uh, the old habit that you know, uh, the live scene in China is controlled uh, by the artists, by the promoters, uh, you know, the labels have no say in that. Also the merchandise and the brand corporations that the artists enter into, you know, to support their value, yeah. uh, are also done directly. And uh, the labels here are sitting on the sidelines and one of the major obstacles to really gain market share always was that there, has no, that there was no platform where they could sell music. So that takes away a lot of their power, and um, they're still doing great work, right? So when we talk about uh, major labels in China, we talk about Warner, who, interestingly enough, is you know the market leader in China, but only because very early on, they have concentrated on signing Chinese artists and releasing uh, Chinese music, and they've done that very well, and they're still doing a great job at you know whatever promotion is possible. Um, whereas the other ones uh, are not, you know, that great here. They're also trying, but um, you know, it's it's uh, it's not easy, especially also with Western content being their main focus and them making, you know, billions outside China still. Yeah. You know, shifting that focus to China is a major strategical decision that they might not want to take at this very point. Yeah. And talking about uh, Western uh, music uh, going into China, uh, how is the demand for that uh, evolved in the past few years? Have you seen like a growth in people wanting to experience music from outside of the country? Absolutely. Uh, two simple reasons. First reason is that once you are through um, the Chinese Asia releases, right, which is a fraction of what is released in the West, you want to get more content. And the only content that you find is the stuff that is produced in the West because it's been there for 50 years and uh, there's a lot of history and there's, of course, the amount of releases every year are like 10, 15 times higher than that's what's released here. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons. People spend a lot of time with content on their mobiles and uh, that's the one thing that you know makes them uh, adopt Western content. The other reason is that um, you know all the shops and the aspiration of what China should be as a modern society, of course, you know, is founded on uh, looking towards the high civilized uh, societies in the West. You know, not saying that they want to copy us or want to be like us, but they, you know, look at the lifestyle in America, look at the American TV series and movies, and, uh, you know, of course, there's an education happening. Yeah. And uh, that means that people are very, very open to this. And um, we cater for both sides. So our platform holds Chinese and Western content. We believe it's essential. And with, uh, you know, translation of song lyrics, uh, people are more understanding towards Western music as well. And that 2% will definitely increase to 10, 15, 20% as we see in Japan. Yeah, and uh, let's talk about price points because uh, uh, talking to to Alejandro in, Col in Colombia uh, yesterday, uh, you know, a similar conversation came up about the fact that there's only uh, as much as uh, people like to think that there is a huge market in in certain Latin American countries, it's actually only a, a relatively small. Uh, percentage of the population that can actually uh, afford uh, both uh, the devices and, and the access to, the, to, to legal music as well. And so uh, what is the situation in China? Uh, uh, what do you think would be like a, a, a okay price points that would appeal to, to a mass, uh, you know, 
population uh, instead of just appealing to to a few to selected few. Uh, to analyze that, it's uh, best to look at uh, the subscription services that are already existing. Yeah. And uh, the most successful ones are video subscription uh, services uh, for user-generated content, but also for professionally uh, provided content. Those subscription services are ranging somewhere in between 10, 25 to 50 RMB per month, which is around um, you know, 5 to $20 a month. And uh, I think that's quite significant. Also, you know, people only start to have disposable income. And uh, they spend it on their mobile phone because that's the one device that um, makes them an individual. Yeah. And they also spend it on cinema tickets. They spend it on music festivals and on fashion. And make no mistake, you know, the tickets for cinema, Iron Man 3 was a big hit in China, obviously. And the ticket was 160 RMB. And that's already a lot of money. And uh, the music festivals also cost a lot of money. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, the viability is here. It's just that you will not see a $1 per track download mechanism working in China. It's all going to be in a different way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, let's talk about Pai Shuba now. Uh, so uh, how did you come about with the concept? How long did it take you to develop it's a funny story because we were sitting with China Mobile uh, one and a half years ago and um, expressed that we would wish to integrate a one million strong catalog into their database. And they said that's impossible because they don't have the capacity. You know, Usually content platforms in China have a maximum capacity of 100,000 tracks overall. Most of them are between 20 and 30,000 tracks. So nothing like iTunes with 23 million it uh, doesn't exist here. And um, so they had suggested we build our own platform and they would host it. And uh, we went away from that meeting uh, being kind of shell-shocked because we never uh, thought of a B2C component of our business in China because that has obvious you know, financial and strategic implications. So we built, uh, we built uh, Paishoba in uh, you know, almost you know, six to eight months and then started testing it with our audience. And uh, it's interesting things that we figured out because you know you don't know the stuff until you do it basically right music discovery for instance is of course a big topic because there's no music history here so the Beatles here does, don't have any social significance just <laughs> the music is nice yeah. and you want to step that that's why we are putting a lot of effort into editorial content as well so we tell the stories behind the music and you know translate the lyrics and all this so yeah. that people can truly understand uh, you know what you know the depth of all the history and what is there and really enjoy it yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, uh, in terms of artists that are joining the platform, uh, so w what is the, of course, you know, there's a, uh, the translations component, the, the approval component as well, because the lyrics have to be vetted too. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you're talking about discovery, uh, it's, it's funny because it becomes a, a, a relatively level playing field for any artist that enters the market. So, so how do you stand out from the crowd, essentially? That is a very interesting question because um, we are testing this at the moment with an artist from America, Katara, who is blonde and green-eyed, but she writes in Chinese. And uh, she is already a minor star in this country, so the video platforms have picked uh, her up and her following has now grown to 600,000 followers. Wow. And we get her over in July and uh, for a promotional tour through TV stations and the video platforms. Also, we release her music, of course, here, and uh, you know this is to demonstrate that this is truly a level playing field, yeah. because uh, people here don't mind. Of course, a superstar is a superstar, right? A Lady Gaga is Lady Gaga, um, but the rest underneath it is totally open. You can have a hit or a miss, you know. And uh, people here don't judge by the baggage that we are judging this, so they don't know if Basement Jack's album is the fifth album, or if it's the first album. It's yeah. totally new to them. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, looking at uh, uh, Pashoba as well as, a, uh, as an app, uh, you also have uh, games and apps uh, and the ebooks. Uh, so you developed a whole ecosystem there. And uh, so how do you go about selecting what type of content you, you put in the platforms as far as games apps are concerned? Do you also work with companies from the West to import their, their games and help them translate them? Exactly. Um, we are not without a reason saying connecting hemispheres because 
Uh, this market here uh, can take a lot more content than uh, at the moment is legally licensed. Yeah. And we are helping with that because, you know, there is the one side that you have to make it and prepare it for this market, which, of course, you know, involves cost and you have to make that judgment if it's important for your business. But on the other side, you know, the, there's not a lot of trust towards China and, uh, you know, holding these things in, in legal respect. Yeah. And we are also helping to establish that proposition in the West because that's what we've been doing for the past four years now. And it has worked very well for us and for the people that we are working with. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, looking at the smartphone space, so what are, uh, you know, we're all aware that there are so many very cheap smartphone uh devices that are coming out of China and you know we can all take advantage of that as well because uh, if you look on Amazon you can find like 50 pound tablets 60 pound tablets and so uh, and so of course those outweigh the iPhone penetration for example so when you look at developing something like that is is it always web based do you have anything native out uh, we're working on our native um, app because PaishaBa has been built in HTML5 and then right. wrapped for Android and iOS and PhoneGap. Yep. Um, we also have a web version. We think the web version is critical for social. And also it helps to promote uh, the artist much better because suddenly you have sales links that you can delete, uh, uh, um, not delete, that you can um, lead people to. Yeah. And uh, that has been proven a very successful model because we can integrate those contents into a lot of platforms that are just writing about music or where people have a social conversation about music. Now they know also where to get it. That's great. Well, that's awesome. And, and uh, looking at sort of the next year with the company, are you... Uh, is your main aim to uh, connect uh, Paishaba to uh, some of the main mobile carriers in China? And, and that's sort of the, the direction you're taking it to expand the B2C side of it? Um, not really. We will try to stay right. independent as long as we can. Great. Uh, I think that is uh, essential. We are very well funded and uh, also making money. So the conversation would be too early, but I can see that at one point somebody will either want to buy back the market share or buy himself an access and a channel into China. Yeah. We know that the big um, uh, you know, platforms from the West are all looking into uh, the possibility of accessing this market. And as you know, regulation-wise, it's very hard to do. We came in under the radar, and that's our advantage now. But um, you know, I think the work's not finished yet, and it's far from over. So I think we want to do a lot still. Yeah, it's a very exciting market, and and uh, and things that have evolved so much on uh, also in terms of the way the uh, you know people look at copyrighted material in the in the last year in China, and and that's bound to evolve further in the next uh, year or two. So so very exciting space here. Well, thanks so much for your time. And uh, again, it's uh, 88tc88.com. So go and check them out. A great blog as well. If you want to stay up to date with what's happening uh, in China uh, in terms of music and, and copyrights and all that. And thanks so much, Thomas. Uh, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Andreas. Speak to you soon. If you enjoyed the show, remember to check out our weekly music tech news show on digitalmusictrends.com.